Good evening, everyone. So excited to be here tonight. Good evening, love tomorrow, and happy Thursday. Elena and I feel very inspired by all the talks we had today. And we hope the same goes for you, regardless of what you just said to uh, Lucas. Lucas and uh, Karine were talking about a search, a search to understand today and to understand the future. Well, we have good news for you. We will talk to you about stories about that search. The search for science, the search for the superpowers of nature and humans, and the search to combine this science and these superpowers to create a future we all can fall in love with. Elena will start with nature, I will complete with humans, and then we will bring it all together. Elena, the floor is yours. Once upon a time, I was a little girl. I was born in the land of ice, right next to the polar circle. In fact, you might have seen my home city in the James Bond GoldenEye movie. Right at the beginning of the movie, there is this chemical weapons facility set in the high mountains full of snow. James Bond defeats everyone, obviously. Then he tries to escape, but the plane falls off a cliff. So he jumps off the cliff, gets in the plane, and steers it away as a victor. To tell you the truth, this scene was filmed in Switzerland. My home city is a lot more cheerful, and I'm lucky to be able to call the whole Arctic my home. And what a home it is, filled with magnificent creatures, like seals that greeted me on my way to school, laying lazily on ice and smiling to me on chilly mornings. Or polar bears that are roaming vast lands. Do you know how extraordinary mother's love of a polar bear is? When she is expecting, she goes into hiding. Then she gives birth to a tiny 400-gram polar bear. She doesn't eat anything for seven months, only drinks snow and feeds her baby, and loses 40% of her body weight in the process. I can only try to compare to her as a mother. Arctic is also home to northern lights that form when sun sends charged particles all the way to Earth, and they collide with gases in our atmosphere, forming tiny flashes of light, nature's fireworks. Isn't it unbelievable? And aren't we lucky to be able to witness it? I will never forget the time I saw them first. We were rushing home with my dad in the midst of dark polar night. All of a sudden, he stopped, pointed to the sky, and said, look, it's aurora borealis. Arctic is not just ice, it's boreal forests too. They stretch for thousands of kilometers, and trees in these forests work really hard together with fungi to store generations old carbon below the ground. And above the ground, there are delicious mushrooms that turn into freshly baked pies in the loving hands of my mom. If we stop and listen carefully, if we feel it with our own heart, we will see how connected and alive nature is, how unreal, like a miracle, like a fairy tale, how everything is working together and we are part of it too. Just last week, I was standing on top of this Arctic mountain, I can only begin to describe what a feeling it is to stand there, to look at the snow-covered peaks and the Asian glacier, to listen to the birds fly high and the oceans roam behind. What a feeling it is to be so tiny in comparison, yet incredibly whole. That is a feeling I'm willing to fight for, and that is a home I stand to protect. Why am I telling you this? because nature is grand, and nature is wise, so much wiser than us. And it is working together with nature that we can create miracles. This little girl didn't grow up in the magnificent north. I grew up in the most beautiful region of Flanders and even Europe, Limburg, with a lot of... <laughs> Woo! <laughs> With a lot of innocent curiosity, I started to grow up, and I realized quite quickly that the world is full of challenges, and I wanted also to do something about it. So after engaging with quite some charity organizations in secondary school, as a professional, I quickly decided to go and live in Africa and to work for an NGO. I remember very well 
the first lunch with Amagua and his family at the beach of Cotonou in Bina. He told me that whatever we humans do, the sun will go down every single evening and she will go up again every single morning. He also explained to me the power of the chef de village, of the tribes, and the importance of the African family. And I can tell you, an African family is much bigger than we know. And he also invited me to embrace these dynamics and to understand what was happening before starting to implement our European democracy blindly. Actually, it took me a few years, or even several years, before I understood that Amagua granted me with two important life lessons. First of all, we really have to be much more in harmony with nature. We have to be more African. There's nothing so beautiful as to dance in the sand after the sun and the heat of the sun is finally gone. Slurping some sorghum from a coconut, even if you don't know if you will have something to eat next day or not. So let's do that, too. Let's do that also. And let's do it like we're doing tonight. Let's live now. Secondly, he also learned me that we have to listen to each other. We have to understand each other, and that's often out of our comfort zone. We have to listen, we have to ask questions, and we really have to try to understand, to create trust with people, and to create solutions that are adapted to the local context. Only in this way, the solutions will work. And this was also something that was really needed when there was a COVID crisis in Brussels. I think we all remember very well the COVID crisis. We were sitting at home awaiting that invitation to get vaccinated or ticket to freedom again. I was one of the people standing on the barricades and trying to manage the crisis in the Brussels region. And I can tell you it was not easy. Brussels is a very beautiful but also very complex region with many different nationalities and religions and also many people that are disconnected from the healthcare system. So the start of the vaccination campaign was a complete disaster. Almost nobody wanted to get vaccinated. It was only after we engaged with a whole lot of different organizations and people, often with different mindsets and different objectives, that we were able to get the vaccination message across to each of the different populations by people of trust. And in this way, we could get to a decent 80% of people being vaccinated and we could leave the crisis behind us. As you can see from the stories of Elena and myself, nature and humans have a lot in common. They are both so beautiful, so joyful, but also unpredictable and sometimes also a bit cruel. We really have to be open and we have to understand nature and human beings and to try to live together in harmony, to create the power of human and nature and to bring it together to find the solutions for the challenges that we are facing. And boy, do we need these solutions. Do you remember fairy tales? There is always a dark villain in the story, like that witch who cursed the Sleeping Beauty. If you look into our history, we always had dark villains and dark magic too. They were challenges we had to fight through generations. Now new challenges are on the horizon. New dark magic is spreading across the land. We are the ones who created it, and we did it for good, for growth and for prosperity. But we got a little carried away and we created too much, so now it's contaminating our planet and putting it out of balance. And to defeat this dark magic, we need to put our differences aside and rediscover the superpower of nature and radical collaboration. Let us visualize this for you with three examples. The first example that we want to share and the first challenge is the climate change. If we want to avoid further dramatic temperature increases, we have to reduce the CO2 emissions with 15 to 20 percent every year. Eight percent of these emissions is coming from cement that is used a lot to construct houses, roads, bridges and so on. The Romans, 2,000 years ago, were already using pozzolan, that's volcanic ash, 
and bring it in contact with lime, kalk for the Vlamingen, at a very high temperature to make very hard and water repellent bathrooms. So at Vito, we thought, how can we make also CO2 free cement in non volcanic areas? And so we started to do research with the sludges of rivers and other waste material, and also brought it in contact with lime substances at a very high temperature. And yes, Eureka, we have succeeded. We already can replace 30 to 50 percent of the standard Portland cement with this CO2 free um, substances. This is, of course, great. It was only possible by combining all the experiences and insights of different partners. From the Flemish and the uh, European level, both institutions and financial support, a lot of companies in the steel, mining and cement sector, and many, many innovative startups. In this way, we are already able now to, to replace the cement to 50%, but we're sure we can go further. At Vito, at this moment, we are installing a mini volcano, an 18 meter high flash calciner in which we can scale this process and go much bigger. And in this way, we are sure that in the future, we will be able to construct bridges made of the river sludges that is just below in the water. In this way, we will be able to contribute a lot against the climate change, also improve the quality of the waterbeds and get a lot of more biodiversity. And last but not least, keep a lot of economic value for a region. The second challenge is as invisible as CO2. And in Belgium, we are the lucky ones because we live in one of the most contaminated countries in the world. I'm talking about PFAS or forever chemicals. They were created to make things non-stick and water resistant, like our phones, winter jackets, or frying pans. But because of their useful properties, they do not decompose in nature and they get into our soils and into our food. 37% of our strawberries are contaminated. That's one in three. 99% of us have forever chemicals in our blood. I let you guess the rest, it's not pretty. At Earth Plus and C-Biotech, we thought this is not okay. We need to have healthy soils and healthy food. But how do we fix it? With superpower of nature. So we plant willow trees that go all the way down through the soil to the groundwater, pick up the pollution and send it all the way up to their leaves. We empower fungi in the soil to break down these chemicals into shorter chains and grow plants then pump these chemicals from the soil through the roots and the stems into the leaves of the plants. And it works. Nature works. The pollution gathers up in the leaves, we split them up and treat them, and the stems of the plants, they remain absolutely clean with no traces of pollution. So we use these stems to make circular construction materials. Here is an example of such material. We like to call it a giant Oreo cookie. Some say it looks like an ice cream sandwich, but whatever sweet you prefer, this is a building sandwich panel a modular element that is used in construction. A typical one is made out of wood on the outside and fossil fuel-based insulation on the inside. This sandwich panel on the outside is made out of those very plants that help us restore soil, and on the inside, it's made out of mycelium or mushrooms that grow in seven days. Seven days! Just imagine, we used to extract fossil fuels, send them through complex manufacturing processes, emit a lot of CO2 just so we could insulate our homes. Now we can grow this insulation locally in seven days. And because this Oreo cookie is plant-based, it also captures CO2 and literally stocks it in buildings, helping us turn construction from a huge carbon emitter into a huge carbon sink. What we have as a result is a win-win-win. Healthier soils, less CO2, and better buildings. Please don't think this is a magic pill. This is hard work of nature and a huge group of partners coming together. From agriculture and construction, from science and technology, from industry and cities and emergency services. Radical collaboration to help clean up Belgium and the world. The next ocean cleanup, but for soils. Great, isn't it? A third example, eh? we are removing forever chemicals from the soils. We also can have a look on how to avoid the production of them. And this is something also we're doing research for. 
We know there's a category of uh, forever chemicals that we have in a lot of materials that we use every single day. It's, for example, related to paints, to glues, to resins, to cosmetics. The market at European level is estimated at 100,000 tons a year. What if I told you that we could replace these forever chemicals by the waste of wood and trees and grass? Yes, it's possible. We already can make this biomass and use it together with catalysts to create biomass-based building blocks for these materials. And at FITO, we now have a big plant in which we can run this process at a very large scale in a continuous way, which is really unique at the European level. And in this way, we are really sure that very soon we will be able to take a wave on a surfboard that is made of lignin. Yes, we can replace the forever chemicals that are polluting the soils and the oceans with lignin, which is really biomass made from trees. Again, this was really not possible without a big ecosystem bu being built up with a lot of partners. We team up with the Dutch research organization TNO, with many Flemish and European partners, and with more than 500 companies from all over the supply chain. And in this way, we can remove these forever chemicals, we can avoid the creation of them, and in this way also contribute to better health next to biodiversity and a good, uh, less pollution. These examples show that we can do it, that there is action, that there is hope. Once I felt powerless. Then I read that every societal change starts with individuals, every single one, and that gave me my power back. Now we encourage you to get your power back too, because Inge alone cannot stop forever chemicals and remove CO2. I alone cannot clean soils, but together we can. Yes, indeed. Let those be the two takeaways for today. We really can have solutions for the societal problems that we are facing. First of all, Let's team up with nature. Let's be curious and let's learn what nature has created. Such a sophisticated process, like Elena also explained. We really need to learn from it and try also to make nature-based solutions. Secondly, we really have to work together. We have to look for solutions that we're not familiar with. Look in corners we often overlook. Co collaboration is so much more powerful than competition. I always say to our visioneers, of which you see some very nice eyes here, one plus one does not equal three, but it equals five, with the V of Vito. So we invite you to imagine a better future, a future where we are healthy and thriving, a future where we lift each other up, here is a brilliant visualization of how this future could look like thanks to the project of world-renowned architect Bjarke Ingels. And once you imagine this better future, bring together nature and humans and make this future happen. We can do it together. It's going to be so much fun. So yes, you can applaud. But now we are really, really curious to see who in this room will be joining the Impact Coalition. To whom in this room we will talk after the show, to get in contact and to understand something that you don't know yet. And how you will be able to combine the search for science and the search of nature and to leverage that with the human power to create a future we all fall in love with. I invite you to come and to talk to me and explain your nature-based ambition and alliance. And who knows, you will be with me on stage next year. Thank you very much. Yes, give it up, Elena. Thank you so much, Elena.